Good evening. I'm using my laptop because of the problems with audio, although I think it's now fixed on my other computer. Um, so uh, I'm going to quickly go through some key elements here. Um, first of all, last week, what I was saying about the Pfeiffer book was that the need, uh, I mentioned uh, the Sycamore School fifth chapter and the other chapters that the cultural broker individual, whoever that is, has to be so flexible because anything relating to culture, to male-female relations, to communication distance, you know, how close you can get the other person, physical touching, can you shake hands, some cultures you can't shake hands, etc. All of these things um, really um, are something you have to learn. You can't you might find them out by going online or reading a book or something about different cultures. A lot of these, as you know from Mary's um, book text, is that she had to discover these by just immersing herself into the world of the, of the families, whether it's the three sisters, the African family, the Middle East group, or, um, um, or, or the children at Sycamore School. So I... I remember thinking about the dimensions, and I, I would love to draw a dimensional chart, but there are way more than three dimensions, and once you get beyond three, I become a physicist or something, trying to come up with multiple dimensions. But um, you must evaluate every aspect of the student, student's uh, culture, family, remaining very patient, realizing you're gonna make mistakes. Uh, you become a cultural broker, not through any test online or a set of books or examinations you take. You become that after you do it on the job. It's one of those things that you're an apprentice and you're teaching yourself. And of course, the families are teaching you. So, um, Certainly, there's a spiritual part of this. You can look at it in a religious sense, or you can look at it in a humanitarian sense, however you want to look at it. But your commitment to the family and to um, the individuals uh, and, and, the, and how far you can go in terms of giving ideas, uh, the limitations you may have because you are an outsider, and the door may not open all that way, all that far open for you to get inside. Um, some limitations on the fact that if you're a woman, you may not be treated with respect. If, if you're a man, you may uh, violate some rules by getting too involved because there are rules about male-female interaction. Um, i give you an example, uh, doing home visits. If you're, you can't go as a single guy and go to the house with a woman at home with the kids, in some cultures, that would be considered weird. And um, if they don't recognize that teachers or school counselors might come do a home visit, you want to make sure that you have permission to do the home visit. So, so there are many, many aspects you have to take into account. It, it's so many that it's almost pointless for me to make this video and say, well, here's some examples because I'll never come close to the the number of examples that you may, um, you know, that you may tangibly need in order to work with a certain group. Um, I haven't even talked much about religion, different religions, different, uh, um, different set of rules, part of the culture. Um, so, now having said that, and I'm eager to make sure this is okay. I'm gonna move on to our to what I wanna do this week. Um, you're sending in your essays on uh, on the scenarios over Pfeiffer. Uh, Pfeiffer. Um, I'm really looking forward to reading those. I'm finishing up interviews. I still have several more to go. Uh, I am giving you feedback on those, and I'm trying to give you pretty detailed feedback, so. If I see something unusual or I don't quite understand, I'm going to try to talk to you about it. And then I encourage you to respond to me. You know, you don't have to, but uh, uh, some of these interviews are incredible. And a lot of them, uh, several of them, are not necessarily 
of ideal situations, yet they're real situations, and that's what I'm interested in. Um, of course, I like I love it when you interview someone who's really good at working with students, but I just want to make sure that you know um, you you have to interview who you're able to interview, and sometimes you get a an ideal person, almost a saintly person. And, and some of you deal with teachers who are trying to survive. And most of us are trying to survive, you know. But I do want to share these interviews, and I am asking for permission in some cases to share those. Um, some of them move you to tears. I was, I was amazed. I, w I want to talk to the some of the interviewees because... Uh, I'll be very frank, they're a far better teacher than I can be to you here. I want to put them on television. I would love to have them on teaching one of these classes in our program. That's how strongly I feel about it. Um, but I don't, you know, sometimes you discover people, ESL people do usually aren't the, aren't, uh, or those that work in multicultural situations aren't usually highlighted you know, because they're working with students that may be academically struggling, although there are some incredible examples of students that are uh, from those situations that can become great leaders in our own culture. Okay, well, now I want to switch gears. I want to talk about books. And what I'm going to put up for you to watch are some videos I did about three years ago of my own uh, book collection. Uh, I'll add more to it, but that's what the lesson is going to be for this week. Um, right now for the month of November, and really because you have that one project left once this paper's in, I'm going to have a couple of blackboards that will be very light and fun. And we're just going to basically, I'm going to feed you as much information as I can that may be useful to you. Um, I want to start out with books. I love books. Uh, I'm not a teacher of reading, although it's part of what I deal with as an ESL teacher. But the aspect of multiculturalism, and I'm, I'm very tempted to reach because, you know, I can show you that I have a lot of books here, uh, all kinds of books. And um, they're very um, important to me. Um, I collect them almost like you would collect a uh, I don't know, some people collect stamps. I, I collect baseball cards, you know. I have Nolan Ryan's rookie card, by the way. Any baseball people out there? And I have some other interesting things. I actually have Roger Maris's autograph. I didn't realize they had it. Somebody gave it to me. I thought he had faked it. It turned out it really was Roger Maris's autograph. It's quite valuable now, too. If you don't know where Roger Maris is, that's okay. I won't give that as, as an assignment. But... Um, I do want to say that uh, I have books of all different levels. I have one thing to say to you as a statement, that in order to teach about another culture, in order to understand about another culture, to care about it, you have to find beauty in that culture. That's my quote. I don't think I've ever read that from anyone else, but my quote is, to appreciate and really grasp another culture or language or any aspect of it, you have to see the beauty in it. People that ridicule Islamic faith, people that ridicule uh, or ridiculed uh, Jews, um, African American culture, uh, Hispanics, any of these groups and all the others that are hated, for one reason or another, or minimalized, I call it. If you don't see beauty in their culture, in their religion, in their art, in, in their dance, if you don't see the beauty in it, and you have to get that across to your students, because if they don't, if nothing glistens in it, you know, that poem about all that glistens is not gold, well, you gotta find something that glistens for the students, and then that would be cultural gold. Um, I don't know what that might be. It might be a poem. It might be an essay written and translated. It might be a novel. A lot of times um, that's a great way to approach kids with novels, higher level stuff. But any level can work. 
It could be the nature or the ecology of the country. It could be their, their religious beliefs, okay? You might get in some trouble there explaining those, but uh, that may be something at least that you should have the freedom to explore. I realize as public school teachers, most of you, there are limits to what, you know, you have to kind of take a temperature reading of what you can say in school. Um, in praising one thing, you may be seen as uh, putting down another thing or minimizing it or proselytizing, trying to convert somebody. Um, so everything's with a grain of salt. But um, um, I I'm going to tell you what I love about certain cultures that I'm uh, with Hispanic culture. I like the, I like the manners and I like the, uh, uh, the very formal interaction. I see it when I'm at Walmart and two gentlemen or p different people will talk in Walmart and groups. And I think, you know, we never do that. I never do that very much. And the only time I do is with someone who's Hispanic. I, I very rarely ever uh, greet somebody or shake hands in Walmart. I just go in, I get my stuff and I leave. And yet I see other people, it's a communal event. You know, the family's with them. Me, I'm just racing in about 10 o'clock at night, grabbing enough stuff for our daycare. So um, I'm not very, you know, I'm not unfriendly. But on the other hand, I'm in a big hurry. And I, that, I think that's very typical of my culture, or at least kind of where I'm from, is that we're too busy to, to uh, you know, if we're at some kind of a church picnic or something or a community event, then maybe I'm a little friendlier. But you, it's hard to believe I wouldn't be friendly, right? Um, so you have to think about it. That's something I admire. It's, it's something that's so obvious. Um, I like the language. I like Spanish. I like French language, too. I think it's a beautiful language. Um, I'm not as, not as crazy about German. Um, other languages, um, uh, different things. I, I think in terms of uh, Middle East, I love the art. You know, there's a lot of geometric forms in their art because Islam forbids or pretty much forbids uh, any kind of worship of human like idols or anything like a statue like you'd see in a in a Christian church you might see a statue and some people don't allow those but um, so their art is very geometric I think the Taj Mahal which basically an Islamic art form more or less and uh, and also uh, the uh, oh gosh the beautiful place in um, in southern Spain, and I'll think of it later after I'm out of the podcast, but their art, Arabic culture and art, it's kind of a combination of Roman with Muslim. I, I just look at their art as incredible. I like, the, uh, I like the Russian, you know. So I admire art, and I admire languages, and I admire aspects of the social. With English-speaking people, what I admire, especially in England, I like the way they speak. I like the, I like their accent. Um, I like their use of language. I think it's far more sophisticated than American English, and, and much more intellectually stimulating. I'd much rather listen to an Englishman lecture than listen to an American lecture in, in most cases. Um, Native Americans, um, I admire. I admire a lot about them. I don't know as much about Native Americans. I admire they keep their language alive and it's basically some languages are dying off. Um, it's very upsetting because of the culture being suffocated, you know, the Indian schools deal I had uh, talked about. But I, I look for beauty and, and so you as a teacher, I think, if I can say one thing to you, is to find the beauty in it. Don't just rattle off some historical facts and have kids memorize that. That's nothing to admire. Columbus in 1492, um, maybe if you could influence them, they realize how vast the ocean was and how small his little three ships were. Not that when he got there, he did he was a moral person because uh, the, con the conquista or reconquista, uh, conquista, I'm sorry, 
think about Spanish history. That is a, um, that is a very sad thing. And, um, but history is full of evil and good and, and, and it's full of things happening and you have to pick and choose. Um, um, so that, that's my deal. You know, Japan, I, I admire things about Japan. I love the, I love the houses. I like the incredible politeness of the language um, uh, with China. I love the vigor of the people. Um, you know, I can. I'm I'm trying to count all the all of the things that I see in beauty, and I can talk about other cultures, rattle off things that I may or may not know that much about but you see what my attitude has to be it has to be finding beauty you can see a little basket up there it's weed from uh, a tribe in i think it's in africa but i don't want to just say oh i like their baskets that's just one little artifact you know remember the deal about culture it's what people think what people do what people make and yes i admire baskets i admire art it's edward hopper painting behind me um but uh, you see all kinds of stuff books on the shelf there that uh music um but i you want to you want to give a nice grasp of the culture as a whole you don't want to say well they made great uh, they made great baskets or you know there's way more to the culture than that and so um when you have that positive aspect then people can't, it's harder for them to stereotype. I, so that's, that's one point. Okay, I've beaten that to death. So let me take a sip of coffee here. I love coffee and that's definitely not an American thing. The history of drinks are good. Food's good. I, I just remember that, you know, when you think about foods and um, that's something that people like and they like immediately. They can taste it and they say, oh, I love that. You know, some things they won't like, you know. Um, so um, when you see these books, you'll see, I'm going to highlight things. I'll talk about different aspects. But I got books. I got them divided into European books, which you'll see Danish and, and Germ a little bit of German. German is actually the grim fairy tales and stuff. There's tons of stuff about Germans already in our culture. Um, I have a little bit of European, Scandinavian. Uh, I, I do not as big a collection, but I have Caribbean. I have way a lot of Hispanic, Spanish, Latin America, even Spain. Um, I have books on African culture and on African American culture, which are different cultures. Don't be sloppy when you talk about cultures. Don't try to say one is the same as the other. You got to be careful with that because if you have students in there, they want to, You want to distinguish that. Um, uh, quite a bit on the East, on Japan. I have some on China, not as much as I'd like. I have Australian, which is interesting. You know, a lot of people don't think Australian culture. People think put a shrimp on the Barbie and go to Outback. Is it Outback? Yeah, Steakhouse, right? <laughs> Start saying Outhouse Steakhouse, but that one. Very good place to go. Um, so uh, anyhow, I um, so I'm, I'll have all these on here, and they're quite long. And I don't really expect you to watch them all, but I want you to at least watch some of them. And I'm going to try to make a podcast um, of um, catalogs where you can go to find books. But if you go on uh, Google, you and just look up books about countries, you can find it in cultures. I would say this. Uh, I'll try to send you a little checklist. You want to make sure you're getting real multicultural books that are about the culture. You don't want to say Joe, Joe Mezzi in, in New Jersey wrote this wonderful book about life in Tibet. And Joe's, Joe has never been to Tibet. Okay, this is like really bad movies where they fake all the background and try to make you believe very ineffectively that wow, this really happened in the Old West, and that's how Geronimo was. And, you know, all the 50s movies, especially cheap B movies, were like that, you know. 
Uh, they put some makeup on somebody and call them a Native American or call them whatever they want to call them. And that's, that's why the media sometimes and TV, the lack of accuracy is pretty big. Um, so I will, I think I'll end right there and now I'm going to put these up. You'll have this week to look at these. I would encourage you to ask me questions by email if you're interested. Uh, I may ask you some questions. I may put a blackboard up. I, I haven't decided yet. But as I mentioned, this week is going to be pretty light. Um, you're going to be working on your project. And I'll do, an e I'll do another video about the final project just to talk about other possibilities. I'm really wide open to all kinds of things. I just, you know, I wrote a couple of options there. Games, um, annotated bib is a very easy thing to put together. It'd be useful to you. But I'm, I'm interested in anything. You could do a research paper if that's what you're interested in, or write an essay, um, or do a set of forms that could be used in your district to reach out to different cultures. See, I'm just spouting off stuff right and left. I kind of like my little laptop. Hopefully, this thing won't produce weird recording. So I'll have this up shortly, and I'm so thrilled to be back on the air.